As builders, all we have to do is look around us to see the wide variety and scope of the work we do. The houses we live in were built by builders. So were the schools where we received our formal education, the factories or offices where perhaps we worked, the theaters where we go for entertainment, and many, many other familiar structures. In all of them, whether it's that dream house you may plan to build for yourself someday, or a massive concrete structure such as this, the woodworker is of prime importance. To see the steps necessary in the construction of any building, we are going to build this one. Here's how it will look when we're finished. This small two-story administration building is of semi-permanent construction and is located in a temperate climate. It is not the purpose of these films to establish principles of construction that can be applied in all cases, since such factors as climate, varying soil conditions, and the use to which the structure is to be put will require different design and varying building techniques. To start with, however, we have only this plot of ground. As our building grows on it, we'll be able to see all the major steps which go into the construction of all buildings, large and small. The first thing we have to know, of course, is where on this piece of ground our building will be placed. To get this and other essential information, we must refer to our plans. These, of course, have been prepared by skilled draftsmen and meet the requirements of standard Navy specifications. If surveyors are not available, we may stake out our building by measuring from known points and lines. In this case, from the center lines of two streets. We measure up from the intersection of the streets and by triangulation, we establish the front line of our building, which is to be 48 feet long, and drive stakes, called hub stakes, to mark the front corners. One method of locating the other corners is to calculate the diagonal distance between opposite corners of the building by means of square root. And continuing with our triangulation method, we measure down a diagonal and simultaneously down the end of the building to establish the third corner of our building where another hub stake is driven. The fourth corner is then established in the same manner, marked by another hub stake and overall dimensions checked. Since our building is to have a central wing, its corners too must be laid out. These corners are laid out in much the same manner as the others were, by measuring from established points and on a diagonal, and driving stakes to mark the exact location of the corners. At each corner, three more stakes are now driven, forming an angle in this manner. These should be set well back from the hub stake, so as not to be in the way of future operations. Starting from the elevation of an established reference point and using a builder's level, they are marked at a predetermined elevation above the grade of our foundation. Boards are nailed on these marks and we have put up what are known as batter boards. Cords indicating the building lines are strung between the batter boards so that they fall directly over the nail driven into each hub stake to mark the corner's precise location. With the building lines now located and marked by strings, we're ready to start work on the foundation for our structure. To get down to footing level, a trench to the depth indicated by the plans, or deeper if necessary to reach undisturbed earth, is dug. This is the trench in which our concrete foundation will be placed. At the same time, excavations are made for the piers. Here is how the foundation trench looks when we have finished it, running around the entire foundation line of the building and wide enough to hold the footings and foundation forms. 
Forms are necessary for most concrete construction. They are wooden or steel structures which contain the concrete while it hardens or sets. The shape of the form naturally determines the shape of the finished concrete member. In our case, the shape of the foundation for the building. When completed, the foundation will look like this, shaped like a T, the bottom being the footing and the vertical portion, the wall. Although the footing and wall are poured separately, this slot in the footing, called a keyway, aids in bonding the two sections together. The keyway is produced in the footing by means of a 2 by 4 key embedded in the concrete. It's removed after the concrete is set up and the footing is ready to receive the forms. This is the form we'll use to produce the foundation wall. Look a little complicated? Well, it isn't once you understand how it's put together. Watch now as we single out the separate parts of the form and take them away one by one. First, tie wires and spreaders, which keep the spacing uniform between the two walls of the form. Now the whales, which hold the walls straight and true. Next, the stakes and braces. These keep the form steady and located in the proper place. And finally, the enclosing form, the studs and the sheathing, which actually hold the concrete while it sets. The entire form came out of this pile of material. Now we'll get to work and reconstruct it step by step. First, we must cut the studs to proper length, in our case, 24 inches. So we cut a pattern stud 24 inches long. All patterns should be accurately cut. Notice that both end cuts are made from the same side of the piece of stock. You may not cut perfectly square when you cut your pattern piece. The angle of your saw can easily vary as you cut on through. And as a result, either increase or decrease the length of the bottom side. The top length, though, can reasonably be expected to be accurate, since that's where your saw first went into the wood. The pattern is turned over and marked for identification. This is the side which will be laid uppermost in marking other studs for cutting. A pattern is laid out for sheathing in the same way that a stud pattern was laid out. Using the same procedure, the sheathing is cut to length, in our case 12 feet. With studs and sheathing cut, we're ready to assemble them into sections. This is best done on a workbench, which has strips of material nailed to it to make slots. The studs are laid in these slots, and the sheathing is then laid across the studs. A stop at the end of the bench makes it easy to accurately place the sheathing on the studs. Sheathing is fed in from the end of the bench and rapidly nailed into place. In a fast nailing operation, such as this, incidentally, the average beginner usually hits his fingers as often as he does the nails. Start nails by holding them close to the top. If your hammer slips, your hand will not be pinned against the sheathing. And when the nail is started, take your hand away completely. If your fingers aren't there, they won't be hit. These two basic safety rules can save you a handful of mashed fingers. As the sections are assembled, they are carried to the building site where the form is set into place in the trench. In doing this, the first step is to place two of the sections in this manner to make up a corner. One section runs past the other and the sheathing is nailed securely to the stud of the other sidewall, locking the corner. For the time being, this first corner is the only one locked. Notice that where possible, we use a double-headed nail called a scaffold nail, which can be easily pulled when the forms are stripped from the finished concrete. Succeeding sections are now put into place. The sections have been so constructed that sheathing butts together in the center of the studs, allowing it to be nailed securely. While all this has been going on, stakes have been driven along the outside and the inside of the wall. We're now ready to nail braces to these stakes. In this operation, two men work together. One uses a level 
to plumb the form so that the inside of the sheathing is on the building line. At his nod, the other man nails the braces into place. Notice the two braces are always used to form a strong triangle which holds the top and bottom of the form in rigid position. In a deeper trench, wedges bearing against a pad may be used to secure the bottom. As these men move along, setting braces stake by stake, the whole form is gradually straightened and securely set to line. We're ready now to put on the whales. These must be selected with great care and only straight pieces used. Your eye will tell you which are best for this purpose. Whales are toe-nailed to the form walls with eight penny nails, driven in every third stud. Notice how the whales on two intersecting walls are set at different heights. This is so that their overlapping ends can be nailed together to provide an additional lock at the corners. The corners are locked by nailing the sheathing and by nailing in strips to hold the whales even more firmly. This process of locking corners is very important. The rigidity of the entire form depends to a great extent on how well made up and locked the corners are. The inside form wall sections are slid into place and nailed together in the same manner as the outside sections. Spacing between the two walls of the form is held as closely as possible while holes for tie wires are bored through both walls. The tie wires themselves go around both the studs and the whales. They are tightened up against spreaders, which are pieces of one by cut exactly as long as the specified spacing between the form walls. In this case, eight inches. Solid ties are nailed across the top of the inside and outside studs at several points to aid further in maintaining correct spacing between the form walls. Now, we make a final check for line. Any deviations from perfect alignment in the form walls must be taken care of at this point. Where a transit is not available, this step is usually done by one man sighting along the form from corners of the building, while others make necessary corrections by means of adding extra braces. The slightest variation from line will show up instantly later on when the form is stripped from the concrete even to an inexperienced eye. So got your reputation as a builder by being particularly careful at this point. By using a builder's level, we next establish a series of points on the inside of one form wall and connect them with a snatched chalk line. Since wet concrete splashing into the form would soon obliterate a line, Accurately sized rippings are nailed to the inside of the wall with their edges on the line we've just established. The concrete we're going to pour then will be leveled off to the bottom of this continuous strip. So that we may be able to get under our building after it's built, we must leave an access opening. To do this, we place this box, called a core box, between the form walls to keep the concrete from filling in this particular area of the foundation wall. Since the building we're constructing must be secure to the foundation, and it would be impossible to anchor it by means of nails driven into the finished concrete, material known as sills will be placed on top of the finished foundation wall and the building secured to those sills. The sills will be fastened to the concrete foundation by means of anchor bolts, such as these. Notice how the bottom of these bolts is bent at right angles to hold securely in the set concrete. To install anchor bolts, templates are cut from scrap lumber and holes are bored through them to receive the threaded ends of the bolts. By checking the foundation plans, we find the exact spacing for the anchor bolts and nail the templates into place between the form walls. Since we must have pilaster supports for the ends of the girder which is to run under the building, a hole is cut in the form at the proper height. And a box of this kind is secured to the form walls. Forms for the central piers are now built and placed in position. And grade lines shot in with a builder's level. 
So now, with the forms all built, we're ready to pour concrete. We figure the cubic contents of the foundation wall and other members and determine our needs to be 12 and one half cubic yards. On small jobs, concrete may be mixed in a portable concrete mixer. The materials are carefully measured in measuring boxes or wheelbarrows and dumped into the skip. To guard against lumps forming in the mix, the cement should be sandwiched in between loads of sand or gravel. Cement is dumped in by the sack, as each sack contains one cubic foot. Raising the skip transfers the material into the drum, where it's mixed with sufficient water to make a semi-fluid mass. When thoroughly mixed, it's loaded into a wheelbarrow or other conveyance and transported to the job. In our case, we'll get the concrete from a batch plant some distance away. And in common with most construction jobs, it will be transported to the building site by the familiar transit mix truck. The truck, not the batch plant, does the actual concrete mixing. The batch plant is simply a huge storage and measuring center. Here's how it works. After being carefully washed and graded, sand and gravel, which together are known as aggregate, are brought here from pits where they are dug and carried to the top of the plant on a large conveyor belt. At the top, each is chuted into its proper bin or hopper. Cement usually comes to the plant in sacks weighing 94 pounds each. It is dumped in a hopper and is carried to the top of the plant cement storage tower by means of an enclosed bucket conveyor belt. Now up comes our truck to take on the first load for the foundation. The batch plant operator in the control room carefully weighs out correct amounts of cement, sand and gravel on giant scales. The water goes into the drum first and the dry ingredients follow. With a full load of four cubic yards, the transit mix truck moves out from underneath the loading hopper and heads for our building site, while the valving drum mixes the concrete as the truck rolls along. At the building site, our forms are thoroughly wet down to lessen the tendency of the concrete to stick to the form sheathing. When this is done, we're ready to pour. A metal chute carried on the transit mix truck is put into place and adjusted to proper height. The direction of the revolving drum is reversed and the wet concrete flows down the chutes and into the form. As the concrete flows into place, we must take care that no air pockets are allowed to remain in the semi-fluid mass and that no separation of large and small aggregate takes place. A type of mechanical vibrator can be used to prevent this but in our case, it is done by hand, using a rod. This is known as rodding the concrete. Striking the outside of the form with a hammer will also aid in removing air pockets. Here's an example of what will happen if you do not rod properly. Notice the difference between this section and this section, where failure to rod the concrete has resulted in bad separation, known as honeycomb. From time to time, the position of the chute is changed as the truck moves on around the building. To eliminate any possibility of the form giving way at the bottom, it's good practice to pour about half of the concrete on the first time around. By the time we get back to our starting point, the first pour will have set up enough so that we can safely pour the rest of it. As the concrete is chuted into the forms, the spreaders between form walls are removed the weight of the concrete now accomplishing the same purpose that the spreaders did earlier, that of holding apart the form walls. As the foundation is poured up to the bottom of the grade line strip, excess concrete is scraped from the top to give us a preliminary level surface. Since the weight of this truck is about 20 tons, it is kept at a safe distance away from our forms. This is especially important in operations on filled ground. Final finishing of the top of the wall to grade is done after allowing the concrete to set up for a short time. This operation is done by means of this wooden tool called a float. 
The objective here is to get as smooth a surface as possible without using any other more finely designed tool. As we pour the foundation wall, we also pour the piers, rotting carefully to eliminate honeycomb. To secure the girder to the piers, we use strips of metal called stirrups. They are held in position during pouring by these templates. Our other concrete work will be poured later. However, we can jump ahead a bit to see how the sidewalk will be poured and finished. At that time, our forms will have been set in place. You'll note that the tops of them do not project above actual concrete level or grade the way the foundation wall forms did. The tops of the sidewalk forms are set to actual grade, which is established in much the same manner as the foundation grade lines. They are accurately staked into position with heavier staking and lighter material where they curve. On heavy slabs and driveways, reinforcing steel is used to increase the strength of the concrete. When used, the steel is held above the ground and rests on small concrete blocks so that it will be completely embedded when the concrete is poured. In our sidewalk, reinforcing is not considered necessary. As the pouring proceeds, the top surface is leveled off. This is called screeding. Men on each end move slowly down the sidewalk, leveling off the concrete. This process is repeated until the surface is fairly smooth. After allowing the sidewalk slab to partially set up, a long-handled float called a bull float is run over the slab to force the large aggregate below the surface of the concrete and produce a preliminary finish. A steel trowel completes the job. Take care that you don't get in the way of the edge of one of these, worn almost razor sharp by the stropping action of wet concrete on the blade. Final touches to the sidewalk are put on with the edger and with the cement jointer tool. These give sidewalks their familiar pattern of squares and rounded edges. The concrete for the foundation will set up reasonably hard in about 12 hours, but a continuous hardening process, known as curing, will continue almost indefinitely. Since concrete shrinks as it cures, it must be kept damp during the early curing stage in order to slow down the rate of shrinkage and prevent cracks. Using reasonable caution, we strip the wooden forms from the foundation wall three or four days after pouring. First to come off are the stakes and braces. Then the tie wires are cut. The whales are then removed. And the form walls themselves are carefully pulled away from the concrete. Semicured concrete like this is known as green concrete and may have a slightly greenish color. But after it cures a little longer, it will become almost white. Tie wires may be left until the concrete is completely hardened and then broken off flush with the surface. The piers which will support the girder are stripped of their forms and all material which was used in the forms is salvaged and stacked neatly in piles to be used later in the construction of our building. With the foundation wall completed, Nuts and washers are removed from the anchor bolts. And to guard against termites, metal shields are placed on top of the foundation wall. Holes and joints are sealed with coal tar pitch. The cells are then cut to length, bored to receive the anchor bolts, and placed on top of the termite shields. Be particularly careful that your sills are set to grade and that their outside edges are exactly on the building line. The girder is now fabricated in position and secured to the stirrups after being checked for grade. Here then is our construction to date. Just what have we done in summary? Starting with a piece of vacant ground, we have laid out our building site and dug the trenches. We have built wooden forms for the concrete work we have mixed and poured concrete for the foundation wall and we have installed our termite shields, sills 
and girder. On this base, then, on this foundation, we are now ready to erect our building.